I think the last time Jamie was on this stage was just before the 2016 presidential elections, so we have a lot of catching up to do. <laughs> and given we have 15 minutes and Jamie's uh, leadership of the analytical teams at the uh, Central Intelligence Agency, as well as the um, uh, risk assessment she's doing now and has done since then, I thought the best way to handle this was to actually give you a 15 minute uh, speed dating version of the intelligence community's worldwide threat assessment, which they issue every year. So, in terms of threats, uh, the top level National Security Administration officials, Secretary of Defense Mattis, uh, DNI, Director of National Intelligence, Dan Coats, have described the world we're in today as uh, volatile, uh, rising disorder, um, uh, the risk of conflict has been increasing uh, and is more so than any time since the end of the Cold War. Given that challenging security environment, how do you define the top threats facing us today? Well, I think they're right. Um, it would be the short answer, and I can leave now. Um, <laughs> let me give you a sense of what a threat assessment is. It, it's this document that goes from the head of the intelligence community, the heads of the individual intelligence agencies, to the, to the Senate and to the House, um, and lays out what we think are the biggest threats facing the country in any given year. And I would say that <laughs> I, when we were talking about getting ready for the session, I almost twitch when I think about it, because it's such an intense effort that goes into this every year. But probably in the 1990s, for the first time, functional issues took the place of countries at the top of the list. So things like terrorism, proliferation, rather than great powers like China or Russia. Um, and up until the defense uh, strategy that document that you were talking about, up until this year, they've stayed at the forefront. But in this particular document, they put China and Russia back at the top. Um, so I think that gives you an indication of where uh, people are focusing and the concerns that they see. If I were going to give a threat assessment very quickly in speed dating terms, I would say the functional issues, let's see if I can do this, would be terrorism, proliferation, climate change, uh, populism, nationalism, and authoritarianism. That's okay, that would be my functional. For countries, I would say, in some ways, um, not to be too cute about it, but you know, I think the BRICS are gonna be a problem this time. Brazil is getting ready to elect a very uh, extreme uh, leader and, and will be a different kind of uh, character for us to deal with, I believe. Uh, Russia, obviously, ongoing issues there. Uh, China, I think the trade war uh, gets worse from here. The tensions between the two countries get worse from here. And Iran would be the I that I would put into that. Um, obviously, a lot of domestic issues, and I'm happy to talk about them in, in greater detail. But I think uh, the Iranian moderates who pinned everything on the nuclear deal and promised the domestic people population in Iran, that there would be economic benefits that came from that, have failed to deliver on that. And one of the reasons they have failed to deliver on it was because the US, with the election of um, Donald Trump, had indicated that we were going to pull out of this deal, even if we saw that they were in compliance with it, um, if the international community saw them to be in compliance. So I don't think companies ran in there the way that the moderates in Iran had hoped they would. Therefore, they weren't able to deliver on their promises to their people. So domestically, the moderates have, have declined in popularity, which means hardliners may be coming more to the fore, which makes it even more difficult for us, uh, I think, looking ahead. And if you saw the headlines last night, the French just found that the Iranians are trying to uh, um, blow off a bomb at a rally in France, and they've now sanctioned them. Um, you know, so I think we're going to see uh, a lot of uh, difficulty with Iran in the future. You know, that, that incident actually challenges uh, the attempt by our European allies, Russia and China, to try and preserve the agreement. And, uh, and what's fascinating about the U.S. role is that we have changed our alliances or allegiances uh, with pulling out of the agreement from our allies uh, who had signed the agreement with us to uh, siding more with Saudi Arabia and uh, Israel. 
Will the Europeans and Russia and China be able to hold that agreement, do you think? And I know they're actually even challenging the U.S. economic role by trying to come up with an alternative uh, credit debt uh, way of financing trade with Iran. What do you think the possibilities of keeping that agreement are? I think this alternative payments mechanism that they're looking at is one of the most underreported issues of our time, <laughs> of this particular moment in time. This is basically, you know, if if you go around the world and talk to people, they'll talk about um, American exceptionalism and have we lost, you know, our position of prominence and what is our leadership role in the world? Well, the one area you simply cannot question uh, is that we have economic exceptionalism in our control of the international financial system. Just because so many things are cleared in dollars, and you all know this from your international business activities, but people, and so one of the ways that we are able to really sanction countries is we will cut off their access to the international financial system because almost everything comes through the U.S. at some point and we get some jurisdiction over that. These countries are now trying to figure out a way that you don't have to use dollars. You don't have to go through the U.S. banking system. You know, so is there a way that Russia, China, maybe some European allies who want to stay in uh, the agreement, other countries who feel we've had this position of prominence for too long and this is an alternative that needs to be considered. And, and it is possible, I mean, it is feasible to do this. So I think that's something to, to definitely keep an eye on and especially uh, from a business perspective. So I want to take you to China. Uh, your uh, chairman and founder, Henry Kissinger, who at 95 is still providing some of the most poignant analysis uh, on national security and U.S. foreign policy, last week said on China that the peace and prosperity of the world uh, relies on China and the U.S. finding a method, finding a way to deal with their problems. You look at the past couple of events, even of the past week, never mind a couple of weeks, the trade war, uh, the clash of uh, the U.S., uh, of the potential almost clash of the U.S. Uh, and Chinese um, destroyers in the South China Sea, and the cancellation, which is probably the most important, of uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis's and Secretary of State Pompeo's visit. Are we up to this challenge? Well, we, whether we're up to it or not, we have it. So I think we're just going to have to deal. <laughs> so, um, you know, if, if I had been here 15 years ago, and I remember being at a different conference, and somebody asked me a question about the U.S. and China, and China is an emerging power. And my answer at the time was, we are so interdependent that um, I didn't see conflict um, because we were so interdependent. If you think about it now, though, what we really are in, interdependent on is trade, right? It is the globalization. If we take that off the table with sanctions, with tar tariffs, um, and, and those sorts of issues, we start to remove, at our own instigation, start to remove the one thing that links us together. There are other things that link us together, like how much of our uh, US debt they hold, those types of things. Um, but we have a tendency in the United States to, to put things in channels, right? So this is a trade issue. The Chinese have a more holistic approach to, to issues. Um, they will look at this and say, well, how does this affect North Korea? How does this affect the South China Sea? What does this mean for our relationship with Russia? You know, um, there was a, a military exercise about three weeks ago now, I think, um, where it was in the far eastern part of, of Russia, out in Siberia. And five years ago, the enemy that they fought was China. This year, China participated in the military exercise. So it gives you a sense of how countries are trying to figure out new ways to work together, um, given the, the changes they see from, from our perspective. So I think the tensions are here. I think they're likely to grow. Um, you know, the Chinese denied a U.S. military vessel a port visit in Hong Kong last week. Um, yesterday, you know, as you were alluding to, they did some very um, uh, assertive, shall we say, uh, maneuvers around a U.S. military ship um, in the South China Sea trying to make it and, and forcing it to make um, a maneuver to, to avoid a crash, according to the 
paper this morning that came within 45 yards, which with big ships, that is really close. <laughs> so. Uh, so on, on U.S. leadership and on uh, President Trump's leadership, uh, the Pew Research Center just released their global, their annual global survey of 25 countries ranking, um, uh, asking important uh, questions about uh, global issues facing the world today. And one of them was on um, uh, ranking top leaders in the world. Uh, who do you trust, who do you uh, believe would do the right thing? Who do you have confidence in, in terms of doing the right thing on global issues? And uh, what was fascinating was that, um, uh, I should say for this audience, uh, number one was Angela Merkel. Uh, she actually won the survey. Uh, and what was fascinating in terms of the ranking of President Trump was that he came below, there was Merkel, Macron, Xi Jinping, Putin, and then President Trump. <laughs> now what was also interesting in this survey, it, they were, the 25 countries were asked, uh, who do you think should be the country that leads in this time period of disorder and, and unpredictable change? And the answer was the United States. So Jamie, I'm going to ask you, can you grade <laughs> President Trump's foreign policy for us? And <laughs> where do you think, the, since the world is still looking to the U.S. for leadership uh, um, uh, on the world stage, where do you think we should go from here? Well, as a former intelligence officer at the CIA, we tried to approach all international issues as objectively as we could. So I would say on President Trump's foreign policy, um, you have to give him credit where credit's due on some things. Um, you know, he, he has a renegotiated NAFTA now. Um, I think that's something that many people thought could be tweaked, was overdue for some tweaking. Um, you know, he got us out of TPP, which I think was a terrible uh, mistake, because again, I think the incoming administration trying to deliver on a campaign promise viewed it exclusively as an economic agreement, when it actually was a U.S. presence in a region a national security, a political dimension to it. Um, it undercut our allies. Um, I think I would give him not a very high grade on, that's, that's so weak. I do not give him a high grade <laughs> on um, making our allies feel confident that we will be there for them. Uh, I think that a lot of the Europeans and Merkel um, has even been quoted as saying, uh, you know, we're gonna have to do more of this on our own. Now, you know, if you're talking about NATO spending, you know, I think four, four of the last presidents um, have all encouraged Europe to spend more on their defense. But undercutting the confidence that people can rely on the United States, not just militarily, but also uh, in terms of values, leadership, what we want to project to the world, um, things like these, separation of children at our borders, is that what we want to be projecting to the world? That all goes into the mix, and I think, um, I think we, ha we have some challenges here. Do we have a question from the audience? So you're all on the front lines of uh, dealing with the uh, U.S. and the world as you're pursuing your business. Halina von dem Hagen, Manulai Financial. Um, I would be curious of your, on, of your thoughts on how environmental risks, climate changes, access to water, pollution, would shape the world politics over the next decade or so. Thank you, it's a great question. Um, climate change has officially become a national security issue. When you look at the number of people who live along coastlines, the concentrations there if with rising sea levels, obviously a, um, a concern. Um, also things like the melting ice caps, where you have new transit routes now going through the Arctic, um, you know, cutting travel time between Europe and China uh, quite dramatically. Um, I think how this affects uh, our national security is, you know, Different depending on how we look at this. If we look at it at a federal level and you say, oh, you know, we've pulled out of the P Paris uh, Climate Accord, um, that's one thing. But when you look at cities and states and what local governments are doing, saying, no, we're still going to meet our targets. We're still going to uh, you know, try to um, reduce emissions and the like. I think those are all um, critically important indicators to watch. 
If I could just say one last thing about um, a challenge that I should have mentioned, and especially for a business audience. Um, Maybe a couple of years ago, I might have mentioned this, that um, I thought we were going through different generations of cyber attacks. And the one that worries me now is that I think we've, we've all learned uh, to deal with the denial of service operations. We understand when you know, there are big attacks and they go in and they destroy computers, uh, like the Sony attack might have uh, uh, was and the one against um, Saudi Aramco. The one I'm worried about now is for businesses in particular, which is, cyber attacks that manipulate your data. They don't just take it, but they manipulate it. And if you think about what's happened with attacks on the media and you know, institutions that we have confidence and trust in, um, one area that would be undermined immediately would be cyber attacks that go in to a, a company, a financial institution, whatever it might be, change the data that's there and then people will lose confidence in, in the system, uh, the economic system. So I think it's just one important one I should have put in my threat testimony. <laughs> so. Well, thank you, Jamie. And if there is any doubt of the importance of the intelligence community and uh, its at analysis uh, in terms of US national security and where we go from here, I think, Jamie, you've just put all those doubts to rest. So thank you very much. Please join me in. Thank you.